Civility, I'm of two minds of. I think many lawyers are still operating by the old rules of the game, which is I'm going to be aggressive and I'm going to win for my client. But I got to tell you, there's a dynamic going on, a couple dynamics that give me hope that incivility is going to go out the window. So what does that do to our legal profession? It belittles it. It gives us a very bad reputation within the general community. And that's why I think lawyers do get bad names. And it, it does stem at times from these aggressive tactics that occur in contentious litigation. Welcome to the award-winning podcast, Lawyer to Lawyer, with J. Craig Williams, bringing you the latest legal news and observations with the leading experts in the legal profession. You're listening to Legal Talk Network. Welcome to Lawyer to Lawyer on the Legal Talk Network. I'm Craig Williams coming to you from Southern California. I write a legal blog named May It Please the Court and have a book out titled The Sled. Well, before we introduce today's topic, we'd like to take this time to thank our sponsor, Blue Jay Legal. Blue Jay Legal's AI-powered foresight platforms accurately predict court outcomes and accelerate case research by using factors instead of keywords. You can learn more at bluejaylegal.com. That's blue, the letter J, legal.com, bluejaylegal.com. On May 14th, 2020, clients of the litigation firm Boys Schiller Flexner filed a malpractice lawsuit against the firm, alleging that the attorneys in the dispute gave them bad advice and drove up costs through overly aggressive litigation tactics. As a result of those actions, the malpractice plaintiffs were forced to settle as they could not afford to appeal, as their claim said. According to the article published on the subject by the ABA Journal on May 18th, Boy Schiller responded to that lawsuit, stating this lawsuit is nothing more than a cynical attempt by a former client to avoid its obligation to pay the firm's legal fees. The allegations are, quote, baseless and will not deter the firm from continuing its efforts to collect its fees, unquote. So what's going on in the courtrooms across the nation today as far as these kind of tactics that are being used, if they are? And do lawyers need a refresher course in civility, ethics, and professionalism? Today on Lawyer to Lawyer, we'll discuss the current state of civility in the courts and between counsel, the use of overly aggressive litigation tactics, and how the legal profession is promoting civility through several methods. To do that, we've got a great show for you today. Our first guest is Dick Smurgeon. He is the founding partner of Swartz Smurgeon Law Firm and head of the firm's litigation department. He's also experienced in both plaintiff and defense side work, which leads to his unique ability to formulate creative and effective legal and resolution strategies in even the most complex of litigation matters. Dick was a guest on Lawyer to Lawyer back in 2012 when we discussed civility as an art form in diplomacy and the law. Welcome back to Lawyer to Lawyer, Dick. Always great to be here, and thank you. I'm glad to have you back on the show. Well, our next guest is attorney Jane Reardon. She is the executive director of the Illinois Supreme Court Commission on Professionalism. She's a tireless advocate for professionalism, and she oversees programs and initiatives to increase the civility and professionalism of attorneys and judges, create inclusiveness in the profession, and promote increased service to the public. Welcome to the show, Jane. Thanks, Craig. Glad to be here. Wonderful to have you as well. Well, Dick, before we really get started into this discussion of civility, let's talk about the, a little bit about the Boy Schiller lawsuit. What's happening there? Well, as you might know, David Boyes is one of the most premier attorneys in, in the United States. And in fact, he's world's renowned. He's always been referred to as one of the top litigation attorneys in the country. And he's got a, a powerful and dynamite firm in cases such as the one that we're talking about having to do with the malpractice action, there are certain types of cases that we call bet the company litigation, meaning that if somebody loses, they're going to be, be, be out of business. And generally in these bet the company litigation matters, it is one powerhouse company suing another to try to take away that competitive advantage. Companies that are involved with bet the, litigation, bet the company litigation oftentimes hire very powerful law firms to defend them. And this is no different. In the uh, Boy Schiller case, it was bet the company litigation over certain intellectual property. And what comes from that is, the, you know, clients generally want to hire aggressive, high-powered 
well-known law firms. And this is what happened in this particular case. And because of the nature of the case, there was a very high magnitude of motion practice, appeals having to do with motions that were lost, and just very aggressive litigation. And ultimately, what transpired is that the Boyce Schuler client lost the case. And because they lost the case, there was a large verdict. I think it was in excess of $30 million against the company and essentially would have been so high that it would have put the company out of business. They turned around and sued David Boyce's firm, claiming that they got bad advice, that the Boyce Schuler firm was overly aggressive, and they engaged in litigation tactics that were unnecessary that, that ultimately inflated the legal fees. And ultimately, then they had a huge bill remaining with the, with the firm. But, you know, clients are sophisticated and they know what they get into when they hire firms like Boyce Schiller. And they know that when they hire firms like that, there is going to be an aggressive defense in, in these kinds of lawsuits. So ultimately, they lost and they blamed the law firm, Boyce Schiller, for the loss, claiming they got bad advice. Boy, Schuler's defense, of course, is that they did exactly what the client wanted them to do. They were hired to be aggressive. They were hired to be litigious. And they performed their services with, within the standard of care. And the contrary opinion to Boy's Schuler is they were sued only because there was a large legal bill left for the client and they didn't want to pay the legal bill to Boy Schuler. And hence, they filed the malpractice lawsuit. Jane, let's talk about where that line exists between overly aggressive litigation and litigation that's sufficient to protect your client's rights. Does that line depend on how much money is at issue? Unfortunately, I think it sometimes does. The question is, should it? There is a line between aggression and advocacy. And I think the vast majority of lawyers and judges agree that overaggression does not equate to good advocacy. The problem is, uh, as Dick points out, when you've got a bet the company piece of litigation and a lot of money, sometimes the advocacy morphs and stays in the aggression lane. And attorneys tend to, in these situations, uh, sometimes err on the side of, of win at all costs, losing sight of what might be good for the client, might want to remind the client of the risks. And th- there's a high level of emotion that gets, gets wrapped up in this. Our Commission on Professionalism was formed directly in response to that dog-eat-dog, win-at-all-costs mentality. And the court has mandated that the Commission on Professionalism promote increased civility and professionalism in litigation and otherwise. Litigation is the most obvious area, but there's some aggression and quite a bit of it in transactional work as well. But it generally does not serve our clients well. And so that that's the message that we try to promote out there is what's what's good for the client and you know if you get sacked with a bunch of uh, attorney's fees or bench slapped by a judge that's not going to be to your client's benefit and lawyers should rethink their tactics you know dick i've worked in some big firms myself and have seen very aggressive litigation tactics, and I've also seen relationships between opposing counsel deteriorate. Is there a corollary that as litigation gets more aggressive, that attorneys don't get along and it just makes it worse? There's definitely that that part of it. And unfortunately, too many attorneys, in my opinion, will do what it takes to win when in fact what they're doing in, in, in a sense can sometimes be unethical and clearly not within our civility guidelines. The attorneys that tend to get aggressive with each other are those that, in in my opinion, uh, don't have a real good grasp of what the forest is between the trees. And that is exactly what Jane said, that that is serving your clients well. And becoming aggressive in litigation does so many things contrary to serving your clients well. It increases fees and costs. 
it increases the anxiety that clients have with regards to litigation in general. And it also portrays the lawyers and the law uh, and the legal profession in a very poor light. I remember a story in which I was involved in a deposition where the two lawyers that were adverse to each other were extremely unprofessional in the deposition setting. And the client was a novice. It was an independent witness that had no background in the law. And I was a third party defendant, sort of peripheral to the case. And these two lawyers were arguing and fighting, berating each other throughout a four hour deposition. I almost felt like I was a referee telling them to knock it off. On one of the breaks, the witness came to me and said, is this the way lawyers behave in the courtroom? And I had to apologize for what this particular witness was seeing before her eyes. And that was the uncivil, unprofessional, and, and clearly improper demeanor during a deposition. So what does that do to our legal profession? It, 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 bel- it belittles it. It gives us a very bad reputation within the general community. And that's why I think lawyers do get bad names. And it, it does stem at times from these aggressive tactics that occur in contentious litigation. So, Jane, what is the current state of civility among the profession? What kind of complaints are you seeing in the courts and in the bar? How do clients really put their arms around this? Civility, I'm of two minds of. I think many lawyers are still operating by the old rules of the game, which is I'm going to be aggressive and I'm going to win for my client. But I got to tell you, there's a dynamic going on, a couple dynamics that give me hope that incivility is going to go out the window. First of all, the number of cases being filed in state courts is dropping dramatically. A 2015 survey by the National Center for State Courts found that the median amount of judgment is under $2,500. So increasingly, clients are not retaining lawyers and trials are not happening. So that kind of contributes to lawyers looking for more and more business, right? So we've got a dynamic here where increasingly you have self-represented litigants in our courts. Who can take, who, what lawyer can afford to take the case when the judgment amount is under 2,500? Obviously, that's why nobody's taking the case. So lawyers need to consider our value add is really helping the client solve problems and racking up legal fees, making questionable calls about filing motions is not going to accomplish that. So I think the dynamic that fewer people are seeking lawyers out because they're probably can't really afford it. They don't even think of lawyers as being able to help them. Or as Dick said, they're kind of disgusted by the behavior of some of the lawyers means that we, we've got some, some challenges for lawyers in the legal system. At the same time, now this is for people law, we have a lot of self-represented litigants who either go to court or do not go to court, but we're seeing that they're getting their disputes resolved through legal tech, legal Zoom. Technology is biting away, eating lawyers' lunch, as they like to say, because it's cheap, it's accessible, and investment in legal tech is going through the roof. I think all of these stressors means that while some lawyers are throwing sand against opposing counsel in the sandbox, they don't realize that the walls of the sandbox are closing in around them. And a lot of the activity is outside the sandbox, on the monkey bars and elsewhere, where people are getting their legal needs met through legal companies who may not have a JD 
or social workers or just representing themselves. So eventually, and I don't think it's very far in the future, this is going to reach a breaking point and our legal profession is either going to step up and recognize we're here to solve people's problems, do it civilly, do it because we have a profession that has an obligation to serve as the cornerstone of our constitution here, or our legal profession will become irrelevant. We're at that tipping point right now. Good observation. Thank you. Well, before we move on to our next segment, we're going to take a quick break to hear a message from our sponsor. We'll be right back. Predict legal outcomes with Blue Jay Legal's Foresight Platforms. Using AI to analyze thousands of cases and administrative rulings, Blue Jay Legal can predict with 90% accuracy on average how a judge would likely rule in your case. Plus, you can research by factors and outcomes to find the relevant cases in seconds. Stay ahead of the curve and learn more at BlueJLegal.com. That's blue, the letter J, legal.com. BlueJLegal.com. And welcome back to Lawyer to Lawyer. I'm Craig Williams, and with us today is Dick Smurgeon, founding partner of Swartz Smurgeon, and an attorney, Jane Reardon, the executive director of the Illinois Supreme Court Commission on Professionalism. We've been talking about aggressive litigation and civility in the courts. Well, Dick, let's talk about the kinds of things that Jane was mentioning before the break, this reduced litigation. What can attorneys do to ensure that their clients get good value and that they are not engaged in overly aggressive litigation? I mean, personally, I can tell you some war stories about cases where opposing counsel has just beat my client into the ground and hardly given a chance to, uh, to work on a case. Well, Craig, you know, that's a really good question. And I, I think what is happening in the legal profession is because of the cost associated with a lawsuit and going to trial, the advent of mediation, settlement conferences, and alternate dispute resolution is taking the forefront. And I think what lawyers can do to assist and serve their clients well is to get the case ready for a possible resolution, the sooner the better. In that regard, you get right to the meat of the case, you you know get rid of the minutia, and you figure out early on what the client's uh, goals are and how are you going to achieve them. And how we do it at our firm is rather simple. We find out what our client's goals are. We know how to get those goals as far as what do we need from the other side in discovery to be able to evaluate whether it's exposure uh, to our client if they're a defendant or whether it's to prosecute it for a money judgment or settlement. We make those uh, recommendations to the client and we get the case ready to go to mediation. And generally, I have found that through this alternate dispute resolution, meaning that you're not going to the courtroom, you're going to a third party mediator that's going to work with the parties to settle the case, that you can get a quick, efficient, and economic resolution that's in the best interest of your client. And as Gene had said, far less people are retaining lawyers. Clearly, there's far less jury trials in our courtrooms today as they were back in 2012. And the reason for that is because lawyers are doing the right thing. They're serving their clients well, and they're trying to figure out at an early stage, how to resolve the matter. And that's how I've seen at least changes being made for the the past decade. Jane, your commission has some initiatives that they're working on to promote civility. What kinds of things are the courts doing to uh, get a grip on this? Well, we do a lot of educational programming, CLEs, around this issue. In addition, we do some education of the judges. The judges are really in the power position here if they want to reduce incivility amongst the lawyers who appear before them, right? When I practice, you know which judges are going to come down hard if you exaggerate or point fingers or create a discovery dispute that's beyond reasonable, etc. And we are encouraging through judicial education lawyers to take more of a leader, or rather judges, to take more of a leadership position. Because truly, if it didn't work, there wouldn't be 
lawyers creating incivil and unprofessional tactics in litigation. The reason it works, the reason they do it is it gives them a perceived, at least, leg up in litigation. So I think education is a big piece of it. In addition, I think courts are concerned. Here in Illinois, our civil filings are down 30 percent over the last 20 years. And so courts are trying to open up the idea of being problem solver courts. Just like Dick was saying, um, alternative dispute resolution. Well, I don't think we as the legal profession and as the judiciary want to offload that responsibility to to third parties, right? Isn't that our obligation as the co-equal third branch of the government? So the courts are involved in in working to promote problem solving and doing what they can to help litigants resolve their matters efficiently and effectively. Well, Dick, in the beginning of the conversation, we were talking about, you know, clients that know what's going on in the overly aggressive bet the company style litigation. But there's also the flip side of that. You know, if Boyce Schiller had not undertaken to, let's say, flip every stone over, as the phrase goes, could the client have charged that the firm didn't do enough in losing its case? Well, that's generally what you see in these kinds of legal malpractice actions. It's not that the law firm generally was overly aggressive. It's that most allegations we see in legal malpractice actions are the clients asserting that the lawyers did not do enough, which is the ironic part of the Boyce Schiller lawsuit. It, this is not the norm lawsuit. And so you're right, because you win if you don't and you lose if you do, and vice versa. And in this case, you know, I, I, I truly believe that clients that are involved with this type of litigation try to find law firms that are known to be aggressive. And I, I will tell you, and I think Jane would agree that there are firms in our country that are known to be leave no stones unturned, aggressive, win at all costs type of lawyers and law firms. And they charge a lot of money. I mean, that's the second part of that is, is that I would think that the Boys Schuler firm was not cheap as far as their hourly rates. And I think the client was well aware of that. And you sort of buy into it. But you're right, Craig. I mean, the irony of the Boyce Schuler case is the fact that they worked perhaps overly hard or overly aggressive and, and it did more than a normal fir- firm would do. And they got sued for that when, like I said, the norm is my lawyer was incompetent. They didn't do enough. They didn't let me know what was going on. Well, Jane, where does the responsibility for this lie? I mean, it was almost in the beginning when we were talking with Dick, he mentioned that, you know, a client comes along in this kind of litigation and given the size of, of the client, a wealthy, large cap company, it has counsel in place and it knows what it's doing. Where does the responsibility lie for the litigation? Does it lie with a law firm? Does it lie with an informed client? That's a really good point. I think that in in the boy's case, obviously the client knew what what they were getting. And I agree that there are aggressive firms, there are aggressive individuals, and there are informed clients who seek them out. There are also, though, for the less informed potential customer and client, they don't know what is normal, right, for a lawyer's behavior. Is this what all lawyers do? I guess so. It's what I saw on TV or I saw it on Netflix, whatever. But I think that each individual has to decide how do they want to behave as a professional? What do they want to stand for? I know that some engagement letters, I don't know if Dick's Firms does this, but it's very clearly laid out in some that I will decide as your lawyer the tone of emails and the tactics. And they explicitly say stuff like, I will be civil and civility is not weakness. That's my choice to make. I think too many lawyers are fearful of losing clients to come out and say that. But I think to some extent, it is up to us. We are professionals. It is a self-regulated profession that we should stand for some civility, decorum, independence, and integrity 
because that's that's what we are as lawyers and as the legal profession. And we do have an obligation to the, the integrity of the system as a whole. It's not just to our individual clients, but in the preamble, I love to quote the preamble to the rules of professional conduct. It lays out responsibilities that lawyers have, not only to their own clients, but to the, the system, the legal system, and as a public citizen with a special responsibility for the quality of justice. And so those last two arms are very important when we consider our behavior as reflecting the system and how we are pushing for the quality of justice, including access to justice and the fact that clients are turning away from lawyers. That's a particular concern to me. Really great points. Thank you very much. Well, we've just about reached the end of our program, so we'd like to take this opportunity to invite our guests to share their final thoughts along with their contact information. So, Dick, we'll turn to you first. Well, this is a topic that's very sincere and dear to my heart. And I would say and agree with Jane that I'm serving the cause of justice and do not allow your client's feelings to override your professional duties is at the forefront. And as lawyers, I do believe that not only do we have to honor our commitments, but more so, we have to control our emotions and curb our anger. And in that regard, if we can all learn to do that, I think you'll see the conduct in the courtroom be more candid and prepared. I think that you would find that, you know, in our system of justice, conduct towards opposing counsels, parties and witnesses would be better served without personal attacks and and meeting and conferring in good faith. And so I would say that there's no more important topic for lawyers to consider and reflect upon the civility. I practice in San Diego and our county bar association, the San Diego County Bar Association, does have its own attorney civility and practice guidelines. And I was proud enough to be involved with drafting those We took that very seriously, and I hope that everybody could take a look at what we did in San Diego and reflect that particular feeling and mentality throughout throughout uh, the legal profession and throughout our country. Great. And how can our listeners reach out to you? Oh, I'm a lawyer in San Diego, about a firm of 18 lawyers, and uh, they could reach me at my email address, which is das at sscelaw.com. Jane, your opportunity to wrap up and give your final thoughts along with your contact information. Oh, thanks, Craig. And th- and thanks, Dick. It's been very enjoyable to talk about this topic with you. And kudos to the leadership of the San Diego Bar Association and other bar associations that have been out front putting pen to paper saying these are the expectations we have of lawyers to serve the higher good. What I would like to say is I remind people why we became lawyers in the first place. And most of us went to law school and practiced because we wanted to make a difference. When we recall that in the higher aspirational purpose and compare to the daily interactions, that's why I turned away from being a trial lawyer. I realized I don't like the person I've become. I don't like fighting constantly. I want to get back to helping people and solving problems. And I'm really enjoying working at the Illinois Supreme Court Commission on Professionalism, connecting lawyers through our mentoring program, educating lawyers, connecting them to the higher purpose of the legal profession generally. So thanks for being here, or thanks for having me here, I should say. And I can be reached at my website is to the number two civility.org. You can follow me at on Twitter at Jane R. Reardon. I'm on LinkedIn on all the social media and we have a great blog. So hope you'd follow along there. Thanks again. Thank you, Jane. Well, and as we wrap up, we'd like to thank our guests, attorney Dick Smurgeon and attorney Jane Reardon for joining us today. And for Dick and Jane, thank you both. It was a pleasure having you on the show. It was great to be here. Thanks. Thanks, Craig. Well, for our listeners, if you're interested in the ABA Journal's article, Malpractice Suit Against Boy Schiller Alleges Overly Aggressive Litigation Tactics by Deborah Kessens-Weiss, we'll include the link to that article in our show notes 
when we post the podcast. So if you'd like what you heard today, please rate us today in Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or your favorite podcasting app. You can also visit us at LegalTalkNetwork.com where you can sign up for our newsletter. I'm Craig Williams. Thanks for listening. Join us next time for another great legal topic. When you want legal, think lawyer to lawyer. Thanks for listening to Lawyer to Lawyer, produced by the broadcast professionals at Legal Talk Network. Subscribe to the RSS feed on LegalTalkNetwork.com or in iTunes. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of, nor are they endorsed by, Legal Talk Network, its officers, directors, employees, agents, representatives, shareholders, and subsidiaries. None of the content should be considered legal advice. As always, consult a lawyer.